to to aha recording for progress okay so 15 minutes maximum speaking and unfortunately if something uh, wrong is going on i will <laughs> interrupt you uh, if you have any questions i think it uh, the it it will be okay to uh, type it in uh, on a chat chat box so we can uh, talk about them at the end of every presentation. Uh, our first speaker is Andrea Filipovic from the Faculty of Media and Communication in Serbia. And he will talk about uh, the title of his presentation is Yugoslav Petro Modernity and the Design of Plastic Animal Toys. So Professor Filipovic, it's your, your turn. And the, the floor is yours, as, as someone like to, to say. Thank you, Rush. <clears throat> so I I shared my screen. Is it visible? Yeah, it's fine. It's everything is okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, the title of my presentation is Yugoslav Petro Modernity and the Design of Plastic Animal Toys. Uh, plastic products became very popular by the end of the 1970s at the peak of Yugoslav self-governing socialist society. They were cheaply produced on a truly massive scale, so much so that people today nostalgically remember the smell, the smell upon entering Yugoslav plastic stores. Silvia Shestor recollects just such an event in her short magazine feature article. And quote, in Ilica, not far from Gundulicheva crossroads, there used to be a small Yugoplastica store which sold the fabled plastic rubber characters produced by the Biserka toy factory in Zagreb. I loved it when my mother took me there. The smell of rubber and plastic made me happy. Mom always bought me something because it was affordable, even though our family never splurged money on toys. End of quote. The omnipresence of Yugoplastica's plastic products should be understood within the framework of petromodernity. Petromodernity as a concept is usually used to describe the increase of fossil fuel extraction and exploitation from the middle of the 20th century in the global north and west. I, however, argue that petromodernity was a key feature of Tito's Yugoslavia too. In that regard, self-governing Yugoslav socialism and its practices in general, and consumerism in particular, were grounded in and enabled by fossil fuel extraction. The, product, the products sourced from it, the energy produced through its use, as well as its use in various kinds of infrastructures, in transport, for example, through the use of petroleum and asphalt. But the adoption of plastics in Yugoslav everyday life did not occur suddenly, and neither did it come from nowhere. Plastics had to be naturalized, that is, made an indelible part of everyday life through a kind of petromodern petro pedagogy. In Yugoslavia, extraction and exploitation of fossil fuels started right after the end of the World War II, and the extraction of fossil fuels was immediately followed by the introduction of technologies for plastics production. Yugo Vinyl was founded in 1974 to produce PVC near Split in Croatia, and it officially began its operations in 1949. Yugo Plastica was separated from Yugo Vinyl in 1952 in order to meet two strategic goals set by the party for the decade, mass employment of women and growth through personal consumption. Yugo Plastica was not the only producer of plastic toys. There was also the Biserka factory in Zagreb. And furthermore, according to a text by Pavle Kicevac, published in Keket's magazine in 1979, Yugoslavia had the largest factory for the production of toys in the world, Mechanotechnika, founded in 1952 in Izola, Slovenia. In addition to Yugoplastika, Biserka, and Mechanotechnika, Tiktik from Krapina and 25 May or 25th May from Labin also produced toys. So 
the plastic animal toys were produced to be cute. The definition of cute, according to Merriam-Webster dictionary, is attractive or pretty, especially in a childish, youthful, or delicate way. Contemporary meaning of adorable sweetness related to children, small animals, puppies and kittens, and objects only appeared in the 20th century. Sian Nagai writes that at the formal level, which is an objective level of style, cuteness is, and quote, a sensuous quality of appearance of object or appearance of objects, end of quote. Uh, while at the discursive level, which is the level of subjective judgment, cute communicates, and quote again, a complex mixture of feelings about an object to others and demanding that they feel the same. At this subjective level of judgment, cuteness expresses, end quote, an aesthetic response to the diminutive, the weak, and the subordinate, and such an Quote again, experience of cute depends entirely on the subject's effective response to an imbalance of power between herself and the object, end of quote. On the other hand, the formal objective level, objective level, style, the non-aesthetic level, includes characteristics such as, quote, smallness, compactness, formal simplicity, softness, or pliancy, and thus call up a range of minor negative affects, helplessness, pitifulness, and even despondency, end of quote. Nagai claims that it's crucial that the object has some sort of imposed on mien, that is, that it bears the look of an object unusually responsive to and thus easily shaped or deformed by the subject's feeling or attitude toward it, end of quote. And final quote, the cutest toys have faces and often overly large eyes. Other facial features, mouths in particular, tend to be simplified to the point of being barely there." End of quote. Uh, the case in point is the Mickey Mouse toy produced by Biserka factory and presented as a part of Vladimir Peric Musée d'Etinstan Museum of Childhood art project. And I chose uh, this, uh, this example, uh, although this, this toy is not made from plastics, it's made from rubber. However, it's a synthetic rubber made from petroleum and natural gas, uh, similar, actually the source is the same as uh, plastics, that is the fossil fuels. So um, there's no difference, actual difference between uh, the litter of plastic toys or rubber toys since they were both made from fossil fuels. And then I chose this particular uh, case study to show different registers of um, synthetic toys uh, when they move from being simple, simple toys to becoming art objects and to then becoming um, objects with nost nostalgical, um, nostalgical charge, affective charge. So uh, the image of the Mickey Mouse toy is uh, the one chosen to illustrate the whole project. I mean, Vladimir Perry's project and the image shows Mickey Mouse with huge eyes and no trace of mouth to speak of staring at us. Uh, the image shows multiple Mickey Mouse toys uh, lining up on a wall, in a grid on a wall. So we move from one big eyed Mickey Mouse uh, to many small Mickey Mice with cuteness effect working across the whole register, showing us both the cuteness of toys from the past time, but also exuding the cuteness even today in this new context of an art exhibition. Another page, uh, uh, shows the images in reverse order, the online page of the, of the uh, art project. The great Mickey Mouse image followed by two larger toys with the same effect of cuteness. In contrast to the toy horses, uh, which was also, which were also a very popular toy. I mean, the small uh, uh, toy horses that uh, usually boys used to play with um, the Indian and Cowboys games. Uh, so compared to those, 
uh, which are made smaller by several magnitudes, the Mickey uh, toy is enlarged. The real, real life mice are much, much smaller than the Mickey toy. However, this enlargement does not adversely affect the cuteness effect. To the contrary, the cause for the effect lies in the deformation of the object by enlarging its eyes and simplifying the mouth to the point of almost erasing it and leaving only the snout. So instead of having a threaten threateningly large mouse, considering that no real animal of that species grows to that size, the cute toy reduces the animal to the passive thing to be handled in whatever way. Importantly, by relating these formal or discursive levels, the object that is cute in white invites the aesthetic subject to handle it physically. <clears throat> and furthermore, quote, with this exaggerated passivity, there is a sense in which the cute thing is the most rarefied or thing-like of things, the most objectified of objects, or even an object par excellence, end of quote. The cuteness with its insistence on physical handling of powerless object is, in Nagai's words, quote, hyperintensification of the thingishness of things, end of quote. On the other hand, cuteness in Joshua Paul Dale's analysis possesses power to, quote, both initiate and enhance intra and interspecies affiliate behavior and includes pro-social behavior, emotional reactivity, cooperative action play, and companionship friendship, end quote. Expressions of cuteness, according to Dale, comprise a form of agency, namely an appeal aimed at disarming aggression and promoting sociality. Both Nagai's and Dale's approaches are important for my argument. While cuteness produces interspecies relationality, it produces it in such a way as to set conditions of that very relationality in asymmetrical terms. The human being is the subject, while the other is the cute object when it comes to the projection of the future human and non-human animals relationality. Cuteness on both objective and subjective levels works in such a way as to thingify the object so much so as to render it absolutely passive and thus ready to be handled physically. Animal plastic toys hence teach humans to be subjects and to handle objects as things. Um, I have like four more lines. Is the time okay? Well, I think that you have like three minutes left. So if you think that it's, yeah. Okay, yeah. I think it will be fine. So a particular patrimodern pedagogy is at work here. There are two levels of habituation of the human body to the patrimodernity. First concerns plastics or fossil fuels, and second concerns animals. On one hand, pro-social behavior, emotional reactivity, cooperative play, companionship, and friendship are produced in relation to plastic materiality of the object, or rubber one in this case. Plastic is material used to mediate these seemingly positive and very human values, such as emotionality, cooperativity, and friendship. This is achieved through making plastics desirable to handle physically as both material that is pleasant to touch and through the design of objects that are made of plastics. Perhaps this is also where the effective charge of Yugoslav plastic objects and plastic toys lies for the post-Yugoslavs who place, who place these at the center of their nostalgia for the former society. On the other hand, humans are taught through plastic animal toys to treat animals as the very thing. These processes occurred simultaneously and Yugoslavs had been habituated to the use of plastics and the extractive relations this use assumes. And as Yugoslavs had been habituated, perhaps we post-Yugoslavs can recognize and dismantle exploitative petromodern fr framework that we have had inherited and that produced the post-socialist necroecologies live today across the region. Thank you for your attention. 
Well, uh, Professor Filipovic, it was impressive and you were quite accurate. So one one minute left. <laughs> everything, everything was really interesting and I'm looking forward to, to seeing uh, uh, questions about your presentation because I think it's, it's really interesting and thought provoking. The next speaker is David Bartosz from Beijing Normal University in China. And he will, uh, the title of his presentation is The Problem of Technology from the Perspective of Philosophical Eco-Anthropology. Professor uh, Bartosz, please, um, it's, it, it's your, your turn now. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to participate uh, at this conference and also thanks to the Institute of Folklore and the St. Cyril and Methodius University of Skopje for having me. Uh, let me share my screen first. Um, okay, I hope this works. Um, I actually, oh, I, I just see that um, I thought I could share my screen, but actually, uh, it just a second. Sorry for um, for this um, because I'm using another computer here, and I thought I could share my screen without problems. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, I have to I have to uh, quit Zoom and then. Uh, uh, get get uh, get back on. Uh, sorry, get, get back. Okay, but you you can maybe send uh, send your presentation to someone in Macedonia, and they can uh, share screen. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a bit complicated. Um, maybe yeah. Okay. You can okay. Another another speaker first, and then I, I would be the next speaker. If if or, or you can wait just uh, thirty seconds, and I will be back. Okay. Okay. So I just have we, to close Zoom and then open it again. Okay, we will okay. we will uh, wait a for, for a minute. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Sorry, sorry for this. Okay, um, so I'm I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, now we do. Should... Um, okay, it looks good. Now it works. I hope. Okay. Can yes, you see it's the... okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for this. It's a different computer. So I thought it it's installed, but. <laughs> Okay. No problem, no um, problem. Everything is okay. okay. So I have 15 minutes, right? Still 15 minutes? Okay, I will try. <laughs> um, so my uh, Well, 12, but okay. <laughs> okay, so I have to be very brief here. It's a vast topic. I'm working uh, on, a, on a longer uh, text at the moment, and I'm trying to just to provide some spotlights, and um, maybe some of this is inspirational, and maybe we can also have uh, further discussion in the future on some of the aspects. Uh, the problem of technology from the perspective of philosophical eco-anthropology. So actually, if you look at the problem of ecology, um, long-term sustainability, um, the ecologi ecological devastation that, that we cause, if you look at very ancient texts, at, uh, mytho even mythologically, myth uh, mythological texts, you will find that um, the insight that something um, is not right with humanity in relation to uh, the ecological environment is a very ancient one. So actually, for example, uh, the ancient Zoroastrian um, texts that can be uh, found in the Bundahijin, they already tell us that since uh, they already um, in, the, in the creation myth, uh, they, they already describe how humanity developed 
uh, certain technologies, starting from uh, making fire and then uh, more developed uh, technologies, and how this led to a disbalance in uh, regard to uh, the ecological environment. Um, also, if you look at ancient Chinese texts, for example, here, uh, the Taoist work Liezi, uh, you will find that in the fifth century BCE, even uh, this early, uh, people started to realize that uh, somehow our behavior uh, causes uh, problems in the non-human uh, biosphere. I will not read all these quotes. There's one quote, maybe I can read this one. This is also uh, uh, by a Chinese Taoist. This is uh, by Tan Xiao, a 10th century thinker. He said, people have been taught to make nets and snares and to indulge in hunting and fishing. One burns nests and then tears, tears, uh, tears apart parents and children, uses them for sacrificial purposes at that time, teaches Today, we make uh, experiments uh, on animals uh, in, in, in the uh, context of pharmacological research and, and so forth. It uses them for sacrificial purposes at that time, teaches the people to destroy them, thus arousing distrust in all creatures. This is not new, he said. Um, also, if we look um, yeah, at uh, Greek sources or the Hellenistic uh, sources, uh, Plotinus, who is one of the uh, important, I would say, um, uh, Hellenistic animal, uh, yeah, animal philosophers, so to speak. Uh, uh, he he asked this question: Why must there be this undeclared war among animals and human beings? Um, Plotinus also describes um, something, uh, or describes this idea, or approaches this idea that we call that we. Uh, subsume under the term biosphere today, he says, uh, the life principle of the one good reaches the earth and is attested by the express principle by the logos, which is shared in both animals and plants and in soul and life. And um, obviously also the um, food chains and animals and plants uh, um, uh, consuming each other is part of this one good. So everything is in harmony and in balance. We also find this idea in, in South America, for example, in a, a Mutatis Mutandis in the uh, Aymara philosophy. So, so it's, a, it's a widespread um, understanding all around the world. Uh, when we look at the ancients that um, uh, the planetary ecosphere, uh, the biosphere is in a, sign of, in a, a sort of equilibrium. And also Plotinus uh, puts the finger into this uh, problem and says, uh, yeah, uh, that humans should not try to disturb these natural food chains and disturb um, this equilibrium. So um, the problem is um, understood very early on. Also, if you look at, um, for example, the origin of the world paradise, right? The English word paradise um, actually uh, goes back to ancient Iranian or Persian um, uh, sources etymologically speaking, it means a walled enclosure where humans and non-humans and plant life coexist in a, we would say today, long-term sustainable manner in, in a balanced manner um, on earth. It's not a religious term in the sense that it is used in Christianity today. Uh, so, so this idea of, um, of a balance and um, yeah, the ecological integration, necessary integration of humanity is uh, very old. And also, uh, if we look at the younger German tradition of philosophical anthropology, one of the earliest thinkers in that tradition, um, I would say is a philosopher and geographer uh, who goes by the name Ernst Kapp, a contemporary of Karl Marx, uh, was born 10 years earlier than Marx, he was influenced by Hegel and also Romanticist uh, thinking and many other philosophers. And he um, is the first person who uh, wrote a book actually about what we call today globalization. And in, in this context, um, he, he uh, asked himself the question, what could be the end goal of this 
unification of humanity of of all these te technology based and economic um economics related uh, fusion processes and he said the end goal has to be uh, the transfiguration of nature verklärung der natur in german a sustainable symbiosis of human life technology and a healthy global environment uh, he uh, said that in 1845 um unfortunately uh, uh, this didn't happen yet and uh, we are threatening ourselves uh and we are we have, of course we we have this discourse and ask ourselves what we can do in terms of our own long term sustainability right um uh and and here uh, i think it is helpful maybe to dig a little bit deeper also into this tradition of uh, uh philosophical anthropology and um i recently um i have also done that again and uh, there's an interesting uh, aspect here, namely the question of intelligence and technologies in relation to the biosphere, non-human and human. Um, there's this this um, uh, quote by Lewis Thomas. Uh, uh, take I took that from the book "The Leaves of a Cell: Notes of a Biology Watcher," and he said, uh, "Ants are so much like human beings as to be an embarrassment. They form fungi, raise aphids as livestock, launch armies into wars." use chemical sprays to alarm and confuse enemies, capture slaves, the families of weaver ants engage in child labor, holding their larvae like shuttles to spin out the thread that sews the leaves together for their fungus gardens. They exchange information ceaselessly, they do everything but watch television. Uh, great essayist Lewis Thomas. Um, and this is the, the the big question, uh, because if we look a little bit closer, we will find that we are not the only beings that are using uh, technology. We are not the only te uh, technology-based life form. Actually, there are. If we look a little bit closer, there are many um, beings, uh, many many non-human animals that are um, actually uh, using uh, forms of technology. And recently, it has been shown that this is. Not just based on instinct, but um, uh, for example, um, humblebees. It has been shown that humblebees really, and also ants, uh, really make inventions. They can invent, and then they can even um, teach their offspring to continue uh, to continue these cultures and traditions of behavior, in the sense of these particular inventions, the use of particular. Uh, elements of the surrounding environment. Um, and uh, of course, there's the big question, why are we harming the environment with our technology and they do not? And um, here, I think there are a lot of um, factors. I cannot go into to every aspect here. But first of all, I think uh, Everett North Whitehead said that novelty is a marker of life. So it shouldn't be surprising that also other species besides us in the biosphere are uh, using certain kind of technologies and also show intelligence, right? The noosphere, uh, the term uh, coined by Vladimir Vernatsky uh, is not restricted to, to humanity as such, but it's uh, actually the noosphere is a more general aspect um, in, uh, we could say systemic interpenetration with the biosphere. And, um, the interesting thing is if we look at the octopus, for example, they are highly intelligent. Um, they use tools, they make inventions, but they have the problem they do not teach their offspring. So they don't have a culture that they that that proliferates these inventions. So every octopus has to start from scratch, so to speak, with their high intelligence. Um, monkeys, apes, they use stone tools, but they cannot make fire. Um, so they kind of stay in this um yeah more primitive realm of tool making um birds are using tools but they they don't have hands so they cannot develop they don't have an organ to to grab uh, the tools and to develop the tools further so they are also a little bit restricted and so forth and if we look at the human world um uh, we are not just using tools we are using fire right that's one of the um characteristic traits uh, we can make fire no other organism can 
matter. And maybe that's uh, the differentia specifica here to, to set humans apart from animals in, in, from, from this uh, philosophical angle, not biologically speaking, but in terms of technology. And more importantly, we are transforming our environment in, in, in a chemical uh, dimension. We, we have a chemical understanding and we use particular technology starting from uh, making fire to, to, uh, to transform the elements uh, of the environment and thus create uh, new tools and uh, create a more and more complex uh, system. And we can we teach our offspring. Uh, uh, and and um, uh, uh, the interesting thing is, what is technology um, to me? Uh, there, this this term that has been introduced by Ernst Kapp, uh, so the person in the upper left, the upper left uh, photograph, uh, no, sorry, the lower left photograph here, um, he introduced this idea of or this term organ projection based on uh, the upper left uh, person's uh, Carl Gustav Carl's observation that um, uh, organisms, technologies of organisms, um, are kind of a projection of their physiology into their environment. So they make use of materials in their environment and adapt these materials as a form of extension of their organism. And Kalb said, actually, we started off like this as well. We, we did that, but our physiology is somehow special, which enabled us to, um, to create a form of technology, which we could say with Karl Marx represents an emancipation from the organic barrier. So we, we kind of transgress uh, all these barriers that are set for the other animals uh, in terms of the use of um, tools. Um, there's a whole tradition in, in especially uh, uh, not just in a German speaking uh, philosophy context. I have mentioned Vladimir Ivernatsky, a very, very important uh, uh, thinker, a Russian thinker, so uh, uh, Soviet era, Russian uh, era uh, thinker, uh, scientist, uh, biogeochemist, a uh, chemist. Um, but there, uh, the, the, in terms of philosophical anthropology, the, the most important um, thinkers uh, are, yeah, from the German speaking uh, horizon of the 20th I'm, century. I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but please, okay. we, we need to, I, I added two, two minutes more, but please, uh, we, we need to, to okay. finish as okay. soon as um, possible. Okay, I, really and I think, no, no problem. Um, um, I, I think the main problem, I mean, it's, it's some kind of food for thought here. Um, uh, what we do as uh, there's a paradox, maybe that's kind of food for thought for, for, for um, future discussion. There's kind of a paradox in our work. Usually um, non-human beings work and we also actually work to keep ourselves um, above thermodynamic equilibrium. That's why we invest as organisms, we invest work to stay uh, above the state of thermodynamic equilibrium, which means individual death. Uh, uh, in the human uh, context, there's this paradox. We collectively maximize our energy output, stay above this state, but we are using external energies um, on growing. And this leads to the addition of these energies into the planetary uh, uh, context of this, the, the functional systems of our planet. And um, there is this, um, the last point here, since quite shocking, since 1972, we have already released the equivalent of 25 billion Hiroshima bombs of energy into the planetary system. No other, all the other organisms, they have a, a balance, uh, they have an energy balance which is integrated and uh, the biosphere doesn't release more energy. It's, it's just a, a zero sum game in, in this sense. And I think that's the basic uh, problem here. Uh, and I think that philosophical anthropology can help us to, to reflect on our own um, foundations in this regard and maybe to become smarter in the future because the problem is our intelligence is a tool-based intelligence. And 
this is causing the problems because the tool based intelligence is actually it's very complicated but it's actually very dumb <laughs> if we if we uh if we really look at what's happening in nature nature is more intelligent more complex uh, and it's easy for us to interfere but we but our intelligence is a projection of this tool use still uh, that's my main my main point and um I think we have to find a way to overcome human tool intelligence, so to speak. That's uh, <laughs> the last thing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bartosz. It was really thought provoking, and I'm I'm sure that we are are filled with questions. And I'm looking forward to um, to to seeing the discussion. And it it, it was really really interesting. Thank you, thank you. Last word, empathy. I think uh, biological empathy could be could be a, a, a bridge to overcome the uh -huh. problem, but it's difficult. <laughs> yes, okay. of course, of thank course. You. But, but it's yeah, it's it's one of the possible strategies, definitely. Not and the only one. Not the only one, but one of them, of course. Uh, so uh, thank you once again. The next speaker is Ivan Aniklić from uh, the University of Zadar. And the title of her presentation is Ethical Issues and Environmental Hermeneutics of the An Anthropocene. Uh, so Ivana, uh, you, you can start now. Thank you, the floor is mine, right? Yeah, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Ivana Nikolic and I'm an assistant um, at the University of Zadar. And I would like to share my screen with you. A second. Uh, all right. Uh, is it visible? Yeah, it's it's fine. Everything is OK. OK, thank you very much. Uh, today, I will present you a very complex uh, topic. And it's, um, as you said, ethical issues and environmental hermeneutics of the Anthropocene. Uh, well, 15 minutes is not enough to make it uh, um, to uh, well, to show it how complex it is, but let's start uh, with basics. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, ask you all, I mean, you don't have to respond, but uh, as scholars, where do we get our knowledge from? Well, we get it from texts, textbooks, uh, articles, papers, and similar. Well, in the most of the cases, uh, we have other sources of uh, knowledge too, but mostly we deal with uh, books. In hermeneutics, we would say that's a text. And environmental hermeneutics in a simple terms would be uh, interpretation of uh, texts regarding the environment, to put it in a most simple way. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, start with the um, term Anthropocene. What do we call it? Uh, well, the word Anthropocene is derived from Greek anthropo uh, for man and scene for new. It, although it does rhyme with Pleistocene, Holocene, and so on, it's not uh, an official geological term or time unit. Uh, Anthropocene is more used in humanities, and it's a term to uh, describe a recent period in uh, Earth, in Earth's, Earth's history, where human activity started to affect climate and ecosystem. Uh, many scholars argue uh, when the Anthropocene uh, began. Um, many people think that's um, uh, industrial revolution at the beginning of 19th century. Some people think it was um, at the end of World War, World, World War II when atomic bombs were detonated. And uh, recently scholars do think that uh, starting point should be 1950s. Uh, or the time of so-called uh, great acceleration, where there was a significant increase in human activity that affected uh, the planet. Uh, why we don't have Anthropocene in, uh, as a term in geology? Well, um, they only have one criteria to have it as a term in geology, and that's a human impact in the rock, in the rock layers of the earth but uh, we use it in humanities as a term for uh, human activities that affected the environment, well, mostly from uh, 19th century and onwards. So that's something uh, basic about the Anthropocene. And uh, second thing, uh, the first part of my 
title is Ethical Issues in Anthropocene. Uh, I will just name here several of them. Uh, I assume you are all aware of them, but still, just in case. Uh, the first one I would like to mention is the preservation of cultural heritage sites and uh, how they are threatened by uh, environmental changes that happened recently. Uh, second of all, I would like to mention ethical responsibilities towards non-human species, which we also mentioned in previous talks. Cultural transformation, uh, technological advancements being in favor to humans. That's something that we witness uh, very much recently. Uh, cultural diversity of the awareness of ecosystem. Uh, one might wonder, does each culture has uh, same level of awareness of what's going on in an ecosystem. Some people may have um, uh, prejudices that some countries or some continents do have higher or uh, lower level of the awareness of ecosystem, but that's a completely different topic. Economical utility, that's something we also witnessed that we put our profit uh, above the interests of nature and uh, rights of uh, non-human species that's quite pretty much connected with ethical responsibilities to towards non-human uh, species and uh, at the end we can mention the responsibility for future generations so th those could be um, those could be the top uh, ethical issues that we have in Anthropocene or in other words from 19th century and onwards. What I would like to uh, present you now is one part of the book uh, that is called the shock of the Anthropocene and uh, the term I liked there is called Thermocene. Thermocene is uh, the term that's, that out authors Bonil and Frasos I uh, mentioned that that's a period, uh, that's a history of energy use. And they demonstrate how the history of energy is actually a series of successive additions uh, shaped by ideological decisions or simply politics. Now, uh, what do they do? Uh, somehow they uh, highlight the key role of Western countries in technological changes and environmental consequences. Uh, well, that's just an euphemism uh, for saying that uh, they blame, the authors blame uh, Western countries and their technology uh, and technological change for this, what's going on in our nature and environment. Well, the authors think that there are six ways in which people think about the environment, uh, surroundings, climate, uh, the resources, energy limits, and so on. Uh, they, they show how uh, our ancestors knew what they were doing to the environment. They knew they were damaging it, but uh, they didn't keep it clean and sustainable. Uh, they think the problem is not that people don't know what they're doing, but they don't act accordingly. And they uh, conclude that it's strange how modern society uh, understands uh, what we are doing uh, to the environment and that we are uh, shaped by the environment and yet we uh, harm it and destroy it. Uh, well, when it comes to environmental hermeneutics or interpretation of the text about the um, environment, um, just to make it more simple, how does it work in reality to show you how the applied environmental hermene hermeneutics looks like? Uh, I would like to use some of the terms that are known in, in the philosophy of Michel Foucault. Uh, the first one will be uh, the connection between power and knowledge. Uh, the power and knowledge are very important because uh, Michel Foucault thinks that uh, the power and knowledge are in, intertwined, and uh, he shows how the power operates through knowledge. And uh, we can think about it when we, we are talking about the Anthropocene, uh, and we are thinking what are the true or valid terms, and which ones are not valid. Uh, second one would be quite interesting in politics, what previous authors mentioned, and that's called discourse. 
It's a system of language that defines and regulates uh, social norms. And we can uh, use also archaeology of knowledge to uncover underlying systems uh, that shape our society. Uh, in other words, we may say that there are no objective um, scientific researches or um, knowledge at all. It's all shaped by power and a language is uh, one of the most important tools in that process. Meaning that when we are reading environmental uh, texts or texts regarding uh, the environment, uh, we must uh, focus on those underlying systems and conditions. We have to somehow um, uncover the whole text to see um, some other uh, messages in the whole context of that um, text. Uh, first of all, we can um, um, think of uh, environmental humanities as uh, critical post-humanism. And uh, that means we must question uh, the humanities so far and maybe bring it to a potential transformation. Uh, what would that mean uh, in, um, in science? That would mean that we have to effectively respond to the challenges by, presented by Anthropocene and that we must question all the uh, history and context we had uh, so far when it comes to our relationship with nature. Uh, that's also a great opportunity to develop new theories, new approaches, and what these uh, authors are suggesting uh, that we have interdisciplinary approach uh, that will be connected with environmental studies, but that would also include gender studies, cultural studies, uh, um, eco critique, and so on. Now, uh, this just is a small introduction, just some simple terms for um, environmental hermeneutics, but just for the further thinking for applied hermeneutical, um, environmental hermeneutics, we must uh, question ourselves. How should modern research in anthropology look like? You see, if many scholars are still working on um, their researchers by using um, some texts and books and some uh, types of researchers that are being done uh, long before Anthropocene, at least before World War II, uh, somehow we may say that it's a bit old fashioned uh, because anthropology uh, after World War II and many anthropological texts uh, and researchers are quite demanding because uh, the whole, the whole uh, society is further more complex than we might think. Uh, a second thing would be, is it possible to change the gaze on the environment in Anthropocene? Just think about the people you know. Do they have the same gaze on the environment as you do? I suppose not, but is it possible to change their gaze or the gaze we have ourselves? And uh, uh, what's the origin of our gaze? Is it shaped by our values? And even if it is, then what shapes our values? Uh, that's something I would like to uh, thank uh, for Lydia for mentioning the empathy, because I think that's also a term that can be used in uh, environmental hermeneutics as well. Uh, and I would like to ask you, uh, just remember your biology classes in schools. Uh, how did it look like? Uh, one of the things that we can apply uh, environmental hermeneutics would be uh, just the basic books in biology of biology in schools that we have. Uh, we have been taught, taught that um, humans are more dominant than the animals and we had that distinction. Animals, uh, sorry, humans, animals and plants. That's very uh, basic and we have been taught that uh, that the humans are at the peak of the pyramid, like we are more superior than other uh, species. And since you have uh, that kind of uh, texts in schools, 
basically you're uh, raising and educating millions and billions of people in the world to have that gates. That, that might be the case in some countries, but it will be quite extensive research to see uh, what kids, uh, children in school um, have in their biology textbooks. Uh, speaking of philosophy, not every philosopher had the same approach when it comes to uh, rights of uh, non-human species. Uh, let's just remember uh, one of the most influential philosophers of uh, Western philosophy, Aristotle's uh, Kant, Descartes, uh, they all put um, uh, humans as more dominant and superior to animals because uh, according to them, humans have, um, uh, have reason and they can think and they can do uh, many technical achievements, which animals cannot do. We, we have heard in a previous uh, talk, which was great, that animals do have their language, that they do have their technology. And yet uh, somehow that was ignored in a dominant, and I emphasize this, in a dominant thought uh, of our Western culture. My last point would be uh, something that we can do all together. Uh, let's uh, all do uh, just a simple, uh, simple um, environmental hermeneutics. Uh, can science be objective when it comes to environmental knowledge? Uh, we have our perspective. Uh, we have our uh, points of interest where we study um, what's going on in the nature and uh, what's uh, harming the environment at the moment. And we also come across uh, with many different researches of uh, geologists, uh, chemists, biologists. And to be honest, at some point of view, I thought, uh, all right, everyone in the world is knowing that something is going on with climate in nature, but, um, and I was thinking, how come we still don't have uh, laws or something that should prevent that? And uh, what I would like to do with you, I think it's, I think it's visible. All right. Even if we are out of time, so please, <laughs> All right. please hurry up, even though I'm quite interested in your ideas. Uh, thank you. But... I will just like to uh, show you quickly. Uh, you have so many, um, so many titles like this. There's no climate change, say 500 experts. Okay, that is published by uh, this American Institute. And it's a letter of 500 scientists that claim uh, global warming is not has not increased natural disasters. There is no climate emergency. Therefore, there is no cause for panic. And uh, those 500 experts that signed this come from all over the world. And what you can uh, see here is what would be applied hermeneutics is something that um, these scholars think that uh, it should be a uh, nature that has to be in service for mankind in economical terms. But uh, for, so, for people who don't do environmental hermeneutics or teaching the texts, uh, many people will read there's no climate emergency and that will be a part of, part of uh, political emotion. And many people will still think that uh, climate change is not real. And I repeat, uh, where do we find uh, these dominant ideas? We find it in texts and in dominant cultures and uh, dominant school systems. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. It was really interesting and definitely ethical choices can change the path of our research and our wealth and showing. Uh, like like our mindset can can definitely be be changed by it and i think that uh, the sphere of culture and nature are so intertwined that we cannot uh, find the easy easy way out so thank you very much uh, 
the next uh, and, and the last speaker of this uh, session is Tatiana Milovska. She is an independent researcher from North Macedonia, and she will, the title of her presentation is Eco Enlightenment and Peace Movement. So, uh, Tatiana, I, I don't see you, but yeah. aha! Ah, uh, you're you're in in Skopje. Okay, yes. wonderful. Okay, so so you can start with your your presentation. Mm -hmm. Share. Let me share. Let me. Not loud. Okay. Yeah, everything is okay. It's it's visible. Okay. Hello, everybody. Nice to be with you in this uh, beautiful space. Uh, thank you, Lydia, and gratitude to the Institute of Folklore for inviting me to uh, participate in this uh, very important conference. So, the title of my uh, the title of my team is Eco Enlightenment and Peace Movement. And I will I will get straight to the uh, hard to find discussion with the statement that peace, harmony, goodness, and joy are fundamental qualities of uh, eco-consciousness or eco-spirit. But to reach that uh, really profound uh, peace, uh, we need to face our multi-level crisis and simultaneously we, uh, we uh, develop clear vision of uh, true eco-enlightenment. So what is clear eco-enlightenment? Well, what is clear vision? Uh, we are uh, in prison, we are trapped in a multi-level crisis, which is for me extension of a uh, spiritual crisis. And it's a result of uh, long-term uh, reckless, greedy, aggressive human uh, behavior. And now we have a uh, downward spiral, spiral over the crisis with the war in Ukraine and even a nuclear threat. So that is our human-made reality. It is not the, the sole reality even on this planet. Um, because when we are in a mountain or beside the lake, lake, we feel peace, tranquility, some other reality. And, and inspired by that, that nature, we uh, kind of inner necessity occurs to begin an uh, introspective process and start with uh, uh, quality change of consciousness, and finally, eventually, uh, uh, realizing our innermost reality. Okay. So this was previous and now, uh, uh, okay. And eventually uh, uh, we uh, realize our innermost reality, our true self, uh, our, our inner uh, being. So we are confronting the multi-level crisis, very complex crisis, and we don't have the time. Uh, we, in fact, we have had the time to our human history, but we didn't use it in a constructive way. Uh, we prefer war than peace. So now we don't have the time. And the moment when we realize we don't have the time, new quantum of creative potential emerge. That's how evolution uh, works. So we have to face the problem, problem in the room, not to escape. Uh, my thesis is that, that we entered uh, the era of equal enlightenment. And in order to be prepared for that new era, we should undertake mental and physical training and spiritual practice. So it's not easy process at all. Uh, and that uh, undertake uh, cultivation of spiritual vitality, which is, which is crucial for transformation into a new quality of life. 
we need intellectual, emotional, as well as spiritual approach, a comprehensive understanding of the whole situation and accurate location of the crisis. And if the problem is as slipping away, we cannot grasp it, going deeper and deeper, then we are in a crisis of perception. And that means that we, we are, have difficult, difficulties in finding a method by which we can solve it. So those are basic negativities creating the vicious circle. Uh, all other negativities in our society and in the system ramp away from this basic level. So in the key moment for the transformation of human nature happens when this greediness, aggressiveness, all those negativities are overcome or transformed into cooperation instead of competition, sympathy, care, uh, empathy. Then we cross uh, to a higher status, uh, where statement to be or our true being, our light of our being, overlooks the statement to have to, to possess, to grab, to impose power on others. And that is passage from the second to the third status. Uh, according to Sri Aurobindo, there are four levels of evolution of soul, of self-consciousness, from primordial darkness, first status, to predator prey relations, to existing as conscious being with the ability to form mutual cooperation, and finally, fulfillment as spiritual beings. And I will get back here uh, explaining more details later if I have time. So deci decisive leap in the evolutionary process uh, uh, is transformation of the human nature, which is threefold according to the same author. In the physical body, we should defeat inertia, laziness, obscurity. In the vital energy, hatred, rage, anger, and on mental level, we should overcome ignorance. And then we accomplish insight into our human created reality and undertake a holistic life put that is imper imperative because uh, we should uh, respect life. Life is so precious and biodiversity. It took billions of years for the evolution to develop this form of life we have now. And many in the perfect condition came together to support, to, to support life. That's why life is so precious. Those are qualities we badly miss as human beings. And those are among others, uh, others qualities of the eco-consciousness and eco-wisdom. Freedom is expansion, upward movement, like, like broadening and widening. Peace is getting equanimity, steadiness, freshness, uh, uh, strength. It is like a downward movement. And silence is all pervading experience in harmony with nature on, on three levels, on individual, universal, and transcendental level. So uh, radical change happens when we pass from egocentric to heart-centered beings. And then we revive emotion, feelings that we neglected and uh, uh, because feelings bring us together and ideologies and ideas divide us. So we should follow feelings. Uh, so equal, equal enlightenment is the reawakening of the human being in becoming because we, are, uh, we have not finished our evolution yet. We are being, beings in becoming to capacity for growth in unity with other species. And the radical ecologies carry that upper need for change. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, there is separation in a even conflict, so sad, inside this equal movement. For example, social ecologies don't get along with deep ecologies. Uh, uh, on, I, mean, I think that Ecofeminism and social eco ecology and deep ecology and other ecologies develop a very specific and a very important aspect of the same movements. So it's crucial to support diversity rather than fostering hostility between differences. And then we reach dynamic peace, balance, and that is experience of the original spirituality, our true self as pure energy. And this wisdom, this eco wisdom, and eco-spirit, uh, East and West are unified. Um, so the spiritual or let's say evolution 
today's uh, today presses to manifest through eco consciousness. And when, when I say evolution, I refer to more wider and deeper and higher uh, sense of this uh, term, uh, rather than the, in a, like a social, not in the term of um, Darwinism, uh, which includes involution. So evolution uh, and involution are like yin and yang in Tao. To reach our goal, we should focus on our true inner being from where we have a different perspective on life. And this does not, not mean that all problems will be solved automatically, but that we will have uh, reached a position uh, where can we see clearly, clear vision, that perspective of clear vision is crucial. Uh, then we will not be longer in ignorance and delusion. And that is exactly, that is the integral solution to the crisis. Uh, because when you realize the true nature, the inner dimension of peace and uh, beauty, uh, we become simple beings and we don't consume the planet faster than it can be self-renewed. And society automatically changes when we are no longer selfish and aggressive. Uh, so uh, let's uh, talk briefly about four statuses I, I, uh, I mentioned before. Uh, we are, as a humankind, stuck in a second status, and that is the, the predatory relations, the strongest and the stuff to survive, social Darwinism, and patriarchal structure. And through, through our history, we are aspiring to move forward in the higher uh, status, in a more human society, most uh, civil society, uh, developing hard, uh, hard space, so to say hard space, solidarity, empathy, compassion, care, uh, cooperation. We have a capacity to do that, but why we are not succeeding in that process? We are like Sisyphus uh, rolling the boulder up the hill over and over all our uh, life. At the end of the day, all our actions, all our uh, work is absorbed by the second status, uh, this monstrous structure, this monstrous system of the second status. Why is that? It is that because the second this system, a ruling system, coexists perfectly with the culture. I mean, culture is materialistic. So this system, capitalist or whatever you like, the financial capitalism or uh, whatever you like to call it, uh, has cemented its power over us with the help of the culture. So what is the solution? The solution to have high perspective to move in this uh, position to see clearly. And that that part is, of course, I'm discussing the, uh, the role of intelligentsia. That is the two, two-fold part. First, we, um, we uh, reconnect ourselves with our, with our primordial source. This, uh, uh, this enormous um, capacity of positive energy, that is the first status. And you know, uh, scientists, scientists and mystics have very similar experiences of the first status. They called it mystical oneness or undivided wholeness. And that is the first status. That's one wing we need to develop. Other uh, wing, other way of our path is to um, uh, succeed in achieving a spiritual uniqueness. So in the first status, we have oneness, in the fourth status, we have uniqueness. If, or if, or if, if or each of us uh, has a capacity to develop uh, its own uniqueness, real that is the reality of spiritual being. And then from that high perspective, we have clear vision. We have like two wings. We are lighter. We are not so much uh, lost in the suffering of this uh, system. We have high perspective and can discern what are our priorities? Because now we are lost in the pain of this uh, our world. We don't know what our our, our uh, priorities. Uh, so we go back to the, in this space, space here then and uh, in, um, install a field of enormous positive energy and peace movement. That is the peace movement is so important because even now we have war in the heart of Europe. We are in uni, uni, unipolar war, uh, in a multipolar world. Different powers are rising. 
each of them have a right, uh, um, a right to exist. We need to balance, new balance of powers. We need new balance of cultures as well. Now I would like to close by quoting uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who is a really, really great uh, peacemaker and he's eminent, eminent uh, economist. In uh, his uh, interview a few days ago, he said, economic uh, development should be socially just and environmentally sustainable. That is not a Western project. That is a global effort and we need to cooperate together to achieve it. Each human being is able to have, uh, uh, want to be able to have uh, economic, economic security, to have a decent nutrition, shelter, education for their children, healthcare, peace. Peace is so important. Social protection, and that is in, uh, in fact uh, uh, from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948. That's why the whole world adopted the Sustainable Development Goals in Paris uh, Climate Agreement 9, uh, 2015. We need a worldwide coordinated and cooperative effort to achieve sustainable development. We need a blueprint strategy and um, for creating uh, this new shared interdependent world. And I will add, we need culture of interbeing, inner growth, care, and a strong sense of uh, responsibility to save planet for the next generation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, it was it was really interesting, and I am really happy to open uh, now a discussion session. So. Uh, be free to ask whatever you, you want. And before we start, um, I think that Professor Baskar, yeah, Professor Baskar wanted to ask something. So please uh, oh, do yeah, it now. Thank you. I actually have two questions. Mm -hmm. One for uh, Dr. Bartosz and the other one for Ivana Nikolic. Uh, which one I should start with, uh, Ivana, probably. <clears throat> and this is this question, uh, this is a question of terminology and it has some political overtones as well. You use uh, the term anth Anthropocene, which is the most usual term. And then you referred also to the Fermocene. I must admit, I, I heard this term for the first time now. And, uh, and then there is another, uh, Another term which is also used, but you you didn't refer to, and that is capital or sin. Uh, and of course, each of these terms uh, has some implication, uh, suggest suggests some convey some meanings, uh, suggests some background. And uh, the the problem with anthropocene is that uh, it's it suggests that. This is uh, produced by anthropos, the humans, humans in general, be it Australian aborigines or American or American corporation destroying Amazonian forests or, or who else. Uh, all, all are equally to be blamed. Uh, uh, while the term thermocene is a is a more technological, perhaps technocratic term, it relates to the rising temperature, but not saying who is, who is behind, uh, or, or possibly even suggesting that, uh, that this is not uh, an, anthrop an, an anthropic uh, process at all, that it is just technical. And then there is a capital of sin, which uh, suggests that it is actually capitalism, which is responsible for these things. So I would, um, I would like to hear your comment. Actually, what what do you think about uh, the term capital of sin? And then, uh, should I ask two questions together? Yes, please. Yes. And then there is another one for uh, for David Bartos. I found it uh, uh, very interesting that you uh, you when talking about cup and. Carus, that you also uh, mentioned the fire. Uh, 
uh, mostly in, in the context of technology, in the context of using techniques. Uh, but um, I, it was not uh, since you uh, you you present it in, in a quite neutral terms, it was not clear to me what is your what is actually your view of fire as a mighty force uh, of transforming ecosystems, be it a natural fire or anthropic fire, the second one, of course, being much more common, possibly also much more destructive. But then again, there is a, there is a, a human usage of fire, which may be beneficial for for environment, like agri certain agricultural usages, you know, traditional agriculture, I mean, and then usages by the hunter gatherers and also by pastoralists, all all use burning as, as a as a kind of managing of environment, uh, and it may be also beneficial for biological diversity itself. So, is it? Uh, what is your view of it? And uh, are you uh, familiar with the? With uh, with the historian of fire named Stephen Pine, actually the, the I would say the the biggest specialist uh, of of fire, the one who knows most about fire and who has written a lot of books. Okay, that would be my questions. Thank you. I think uh, should I start first since. The first question was referred to my yes yes of course thank you very much uh first of all when it comes to the term uh thermal scene uh yes it does sound quite technological but in the book i mentioned that's uh actually a history of energy uh which explains interdisciplinary how uh the whole energy consumption uh was directed with uh, directed by politics uh, yes, it does have uh, many technical terms and um, uh, chemical expressions, but uh, mostly it's a history of energy which shows uh, that our ancestors uh, knew that they were damaging the environment, but they were not aware of the limits of the environment. And uh, uh, authors conclude that thermosine is a history of energy in which our ancestors showed that they uh, didn't think of uh, its limits in future uh, generations. And the second term you mentioned is capital scene, if I heard you correctly, because at some point uh, the sound was not good. I would Capital, just like to mention. Capitalocene. Capitalocene. I didn't mention it uh, by that name but at the end of the presentation uh, unfortunately I didn't have enough time uh, to show you how uh, text uh, is not only a text in today's media, it's also photos and the way how people use their language in order to pursue uh, the publics about the issue of uh, economical crisis. What I would like to uh, mention is that uh, when you see as a scholar or any regular person, if you see that scientists claim there is no reason to uh, do Eco panic, and you believe, okay, those are scientists. They should be objective. They know because we don't have that uh, expertise in chemistry or biology as they do. And that was just um, my intention to show you how um, all the knowledge we have about the environment is shaped, shaped by uh, political and dominant. Uh, thoughts in uh, science and generally in our society. Because to me, to be fair, it was uh, quite often a pleasant shock to see that many uh, very well known uh, scientists uh, signed that petition. And that's, well, that was a letter to United Nations. And uh, if you're a person who does not study the environmental studies, and you, if you see that in media, if it's there, if it's dominant, and you will have no empathy because you're thinking there's no rational reason to have empathy for the environment because scientists say that is not something we should uh, be worried about. And that's uh, a danger, what I would like to point to everyone, that um, quite often uh, these texts can be quite persuasive and they can really uh, pursue people that they think 
uh, climate change is not a real thing. We are aware of climate change. We do our studies in that. But uh, capital C uh, does not include empathy for the environment, it includes empathy for um, one person's well-being and earnings and economical utility. There is no emotion or empathy whatsoever. And when you have um, in a capitalist scene, when you have your aim, uh, economical gainings, your only point of interest is to have more money. You don't look at the limits of the nature. And that's, that's also, I think it should be, well, the whole history of mankind is full of capitalist scene in a way. But uh, we can say the last uh, two centuries and uh, the, same, um, the same level of Anthropocene was, if you ask me, quite identical uh, with the level of Capitalocene. And that's just exploiting the resources of nature on and on. Uh, personally, I think uh, they're much more intertwined and connected uh, than we think. I hope that answered your question in a way. I'm oh, sorry, I don't hear you. I don't hear. Uh, oh, well, something. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. There, there. Uh, Professor Bansker lost connection, I think. Um, I have. You oh. see me, you hear me? Uh, now we yes. can hear you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, actually, uh, these terms uh, refer to the same process, to the same period of time, to the same processes, which are then named uh, with different terms. So we are talking about the same thing. One, one, some call it the Capitalocene, other call it Thermocene, and other call it, other again call it uh, Anthropocene. So it is. Uh, so it is not that that the term capitalocene is lacking empathy. The process itself, those who are causing these things may be lacking empathy, right? Correct. Uh, I would say that capitalocene is a branch of anthropocene because anthropocene uh, would mean that um, environment is uh, dominantly shaped by humans, but it can also be shaped in a good way for both. Uh, a human and non-human species. And if we have that ability to dominantly shape something, it can be done uh, in a more ethical and moral way as well. But um, capitalist scene uh, puts um, money and interest in the first place. And that it is connected with the bad side of Anthropocene. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay um... Yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for your question. Actually, yeah, I, I don't know Steve Pine yet because I, I don't know really focus uh, on, on the on, on very narrowly on the topic of fire in my own work, but um, against the background of my own humble uh, readings and the pool that uh, is there, um, yeah, uh, I, I would say, of course, um, a fire is, uh, of course, uh, in the first place, it's a natural um, element. It can be caused by uh, the lithosphere or geosphere or by the by the atmosphere. If there's a lightning, there's fire, and um, uh, in 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 the in the very beginning, I think we might not say that um, when when humans started to 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 be able to ignite fire by themselves, uh, it might not. Uh, be a very uh, um, a destructive force, but because if if you look at the indigenous people in Australia, for example, the Aborigines, they also uh, are able to make fire and they maintained uh, their environment for for I think 50, 60 thousand years without destroying it. So we cannot say fire is bad per se, but uh, um, fire in certain places. Uh, of of Gaia, if I may say so, uh, it enabled uh, us to uh, to uh, to transform certain forms of matter to uh, uh, to use fire to smelt iron ore to to create metals 
And for example, the ancient text of the Bunda Hishin, the Zoroastrian text that I mentioned is, is talking about this. We are able to, to smelt metals and then we create uh, axes and weapons and we cut down the forests and so forth. And the evil uh, starts uh, to, to, to um, infiltrate the world as the Zoroastrians uh, uh, put it. And it's interesting also to see in the, in, at the very beginning a fire also in the ancient civilizations, it's seen as something holy, right? If you look at the Zoroastrians, they have a fire cult, or if you take uh, Heraclitus of Ephesus, the great pre-Socratic philosopher, he compares fire to the human mind, to the logos. So the, the, uh, the lightning bolt ignites fire and um, us being able to ignite fire means we are participating in the cosmic, in the life of the cosmos. Uh, so actually fire is something holy, but uh, of course uh, everything holy can be spoiled as we know from the history of religions to, uh, to, to make a, a side remark here. And uh, I think the problem, you know, in the myth Prometheus was paralleled by Pramantha in India in, in, in the Vedic text, Prometheus, he's punished by the gods, right? Because he's teaching, this uh, ability to make fire to the deficient being that we are according to the to some of the ancient Greeks we are deficient beings so that's why um, uh, Prometheus showed some compassion and uh, because his brother forgot to to um, uh, to to provide us with certain characteristics or trait to to take care of our own life so he thought we should have fire to, to defend ourselves, but then he was punished by, by, the, by the gods. Uh, and actually, if we look at the further development, uh, there is um, this ability to smelt metal and then also to develop alchemy and chemistry, right? You need fire, you need heat. Um, leads to a technology where we uh, metaphorically, literally and metaphorically speaking, where we are burning things and we make, and we use explosions, right? <laughs> we use explosive um, uh, forms of energy to drive our machines. We, we burn fossil fuels. And um, in the end, this leads to accumulation of energy as that uh, 25, a billion, there, there's this recent research, I, I thought I, it was a, a typo, but uh, it, it's, it seems to be, if you do the math, there's this energy since 1972, we have added the equivalent to 25 billion Hiroshima bombs to the atmosphere in terms of energy. Um, and of course, in, in the context of, um, of using, of being able to use fire to transform matter particular form uh, to extract matter from the natural state of the lethal sphere, sphere or geosphere and then to be able to transform and to add completely new completely new um, uh, substances that haven't been on this planet. Um, Vernadsky is, is using this example of plutonium, right? Or we take uranium um, which is created uh, when two neutron stars collide or a supernova exploded uh, before our, so our solar system was even uh, um, coming into place. And now we are using this substance, which is a part of the inner core of, of our planet and which is responsible for the, the inner heat balance of our planet, important, has an important function. We're using this and we are burning it, so to speak, as well to generate um, um, energy and uh, in my mind, I think at a certain point humanity will have to make a separation. I, I don't say that this this use of fire or burning or explosives is a, a bad thing per se, but maybe we should diversify our perspective where and when and to what purpose we are using it. For example, if we want to explore space, and I think we have to become a solar system um, yeah, based species in a few hundred years because our resources are depleting. Um, maybe we could say we should apply these harmful techniques outside of our planet. That would be maybe one, one, one solution. And, and to, to create uh, this uh, biosphere friendly environment on our planet. So, so to diversify uh, the applications. And there is, um, there is for example, this one, um, uh, also it was an 
Austrian forester. He wasn't a scientist nor an academician. Um, uh, and, and he um, introduced also this idea. He, I think he called it, uh, Victor Schauberger is the name, right? And he called, he, he made a distinction between uh, technologies which are explosion based, so ex expanding or burning, and he called it implosion, to use implosion, to, so to use a different, an additional principle of nature. Fire is one, one of the principles that we, that we are witnessing on this planet, also in a natural state. Uh, you, you mentioned natural fires. There are birds in Australia. There are birds who are using burning sticks and they, they take a burning stick. They can't make fire, obviously, but they're using, they take a burning stick and they carry the stick to another place to ignite a fire, to uh, also to kill the animals in this, uh, in, 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 in this um, spot to feed on them, right? Or to feed on the remains. So, so this is actually even happening in the animal kingdom, but they cannot ignite fire. They cannot use fire to transform um, the biospherical chemistry, that's the point here. And we are transforming the, the biogeochemistry of our planet, which is very bad. Uh, it has been discovered 100 years ago by uh, Vladimir uh, Ivernatsky. Um, and I think this is something that we have to uh, think about. It's not just about climate change. I'm, I mean, there are so many open wounds and problems. Climate change is just one of the problems. And um, uh, fire, I think, is the starting point how do we deal with this fire, which is also a symbol of the mind in terms of Heraclitus? How do we, how do we shape the noosphere, and what is important? David, I'm really sorry once again. No, I'm but, talking too much. Sorry. But, no, 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 no. Everything <laughs> was really interesting. It, it was really interesting, but we really, we we are really out of time. I myself had. A thousands of questions for every speaker, but unfortunately, we we must stop now in order to eat something because we course, need fuel for our brains. So, thank you, thank you, thank you all. It was really interesting, and see you uh, see you on the next session. Thank you once again. Thank you for the great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Very you. Thank you. Uh, dear uh, participant, uh, let's uh, uh, return back in uh, half past one on the next session. So thank you for uh, all of your attention.